Okay, fantastic. Well, as you can see from, from the, the screen here, we're very lucky today uh, to have engineering computer um, professor Mark Slinsky with us from the University of Southampton. Um, Southampton, one of the leading um, universities in Europe, really, on um, uh, in IT, uh, engineering, computer science. So we're very lucky to have him here. Uh, they also have a campus here in Malaysia as well, which some of you might want to have a look into later as well. Um, so um, Mark is going to present initially about Southampton and about um, particularly um, his uh, the world of engineering and computer science. Um, and then after that, we'll have a chance for Q&A. So those of you who have been to these before will know the best way to do that is to put a question in the chat section. So just go down, add any questions you like to the chat at any point, and I'll be able to ask Mark these questions at the end. If for whatever reason you feel you can't do that, then you can email myself directly. You've all got my email address, so just drop me an email and I'll check my emails as well if you don't want to pull it publicly. But the easiest thing is just stick it in the chat and we'll be able to ask Mark at the end of his presentation. So now I'm going to hand over to Mark. So Mark, how are you doing? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's morning here. Morning it's nine o'clock in the morning here in, in Southampton. It's um, It's been raining badly all week and it's now a nice sunny morning, but it's uh, obviously winter is coming on. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm going to talk about three things. I've, I've divided my talk into three parts. Um, the first part of this, I'm going to talk about how, kind of how I got here or, or my, the first few years of my life and why I got interested in computers. I'm then going to say something, sort of the title of this talk. I've, I've struggled with trying to think of a name of this, how to, how to name this. I ended up with engineering computers because the, the middle part of my talk, I want to say something about things that I've done in my career, but also um, why we now need computers to help us design computers, which seems very sort of circular, but is really quite important. And um, I think a very interesting topic to get involved in. And the third part, I'm going to say something about Southampton and um, the opportunities for study, studying computer science and electronic engineering and so on. And um, yes, I'm, I'll mention the Malaysia campus briefly. Um, I've, I've got a picture of that because we've, we've recently moved sites in Malaysia. So let me start off with, um, oh, hang on, my presentation's not moving right. Um, kind of how I became a computer engineer. So um, this is this goes back a long way. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but uh, you might be able to work it out for yourselves. But let's start with what do we mean by a computer? Well, we can think of, I, I've put the, the names below are really credits, picture credits. It's quite important, I think, if you take a picture of the internet to say where you got it from. Um, or who owns the picture. So, so I've labelled all my pictures and that this is good practice and you should follow it. And we encourage our, our students to do this. Um, but when we talk about a computer, we can mean things like the like a desktop computer, like the Dell picture in the top left hand corner, um, an Apple MacBook, which is what I'm using now for this presentation, um, a Microsoft tablet or an iPad or something like that. They're all computers. Or we can think of the chip itself, the Intel chip. That's a computer, but it's just a chip. It's just the heart of the computer. But equally, these days, things like a, a mobile phone is a computer. In fact, it's more than one computer. Uh, you typically have um, quad-core processors, which are basically four computers working together. But the Wi-Fi is uh, controlled by a computer. The Bluetooth is controlled by a computer. There are computers everywhere. And so you can also think of things as, on the one hand as very simple machines like the Raspberry Pis, which some of you may have played with. But you can make an argument now that a, a car, a self-driving car, is a computer. Um, a typical car, not a self-driving car, a typical car probably has 200 microprocessors in it. I've got a hybrid car. Um, it sometimes runs in petrol mode, sometimes runs in electric mode. There's no way that I, as a driver, could switch it from one mode to another efficiently is controlled by a computer and depending on the speed, depending on the road conditions and so on, it switches automatically from one to another. And when we get to something like a, a self-driving car, if such things ever arrive, we're really talking about a supercomputer on wheels. So the world of computer science, the world of computer engineering now is huge. It covers pretty much everything. Now, when I was born, and I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, you can work this out for yourselves if you do a bit of research. This is what a computer was. A room full of big machines, um, air conditioned. This looked impressive. Everything here was built on transistors, not integrated circuits. So we moved a long way in this time. I'll say something about that in a, in a couple of moments' time. But this was sort of seen as the state of the art. And people said quite seriously, you know, 
a country would only need two or three of these computers, and that would be it. We'd never need any more computers. Um, that's proved to be rather a, a, an empty um, uh, prediction. We, we, obviously, we've got way, way more computing power than that. But it's also worth bearing in mind, I think, that this computer here, this room full of machines going back several decades, is less powerful than the mobile phone in your pocket. At about the same time, there's a sort of prediction of what the future would be. This, this is a picture from a, a television series called UFO, which was set in the 1980s, supposedly. And this is what they thought computers would look like. This was, you know, on the moon or something. In a sense, this hasn't changed very much. I mean, there's still a sort of rather clunky square box with lots of switches. Um, to some extent, this prediction was sort of right. That is sort of what computers looked a bit like in the 1980s, but things were moving fast. And by the time we got to the late 60s, um, computers were being used to guide moon landings. So this was the Apollo guidance computer from 1968. The first moon landing was 1969. And indeed, this is timely. I mean, only yesterday, the Artemis rocket launched you know, and uh, people may be going back to the moon in, in a year or two. Um, but this was the first, this Apollo guidance computer was 50 something years ago. It was the first computer based around integrated circuits. That's more than one um, transistor um, on a chip on the silicon substrate. And integrated circuits have been vitally important for the development of, of computers. It was about 17,000 transistors. Now, um, an integrated circuit probably has about 4 billion transistors. So we're talking, you know, of the order of half a million to a million times as many transistors on a chip. So things have come a long way. And this, this computer weighs 32 kilos. Again, you know, there's more power in your mobile phone, which weighs probably 200 grams, 400 grams, something like that, than there is in this 32 kilogram computer. Now, my introduction to computers came a little bit later. First thing I think I became aware of is a sort of physical object with the punch cards. My dad brought one or two of them at home, they were sort of thrown away. A punch card was a piece of cardboard, um, which was punched with holes, as, as the name suggests. And this represents one line of a program or one line of data. Um, by themselves, they didn't mean very much. So the punch cards that I saw didn't really help, didn't explain very much. But I do remember the first year of secondary school. So I was 11. We had mathematics classes, and I want to come back to mathematics several times in this talk, but we had one standard mathematics classes, but there was also sort of one extra les lesson called mathematics, and it wasn't really clear what it was from the timetable. And it turned out it was actually computer science. And the two things I remember from this is, first of all, playing a kind of game in class where we were, the whole class was sort of pretending to be a computer. And the teacher was trying to get us to understand how things move around a computer, how information is moved around. And I'm not sure I understood a lot at that time. And I'm not sure my classmates understood a lot. But I do remember it's the only exam in which I've, I've ever done in which I've got 100%. So clearly something stuck. And then a bit after that, I had a kind of introduction to programming. And um, I used, I don't know that it was exactly this model of machine, but something like this. Uh, what was called a teletype, which is a keyboard um, and a roll of paper. Uh, no, no screen as such, no, no cathode ray tube or L LCD screen or anything like that. And you programmed this by typing stuff in. And the teletype was connected to um, the university in the University of London computer. The University of London had a computer. Um, it was about 30 or 40 kilometers away. And this was programmed using the basic language that some of you may have come across. And I remember the first program that I wrote or start, wrote with, a, with a, another student um, was to compute pi. Um, if you're interested in this, find out how you compute pi very, very easily uh, on a computer. It's not perhaps as obvious as, as doing um, uh, calculations of triangles or anything or circles, but there is a way of doing it which uses random numbers, which is um, quite informative. So all of this was kind of away from home. And then in about the early 1980s, the first home computers started appearing. Um, this is a Sinclair Spectrum. 
Um, I didn't have one of these. My brother had one, my younger brother, rather annoyingly. And my younger brother had a, a computer like this. It was eight bits, 16 kilobytes of RAM, cost about 125 pounds, uh, which in today's money is probably closer to a thousand pounds. So they're quite expensive. Um, it was programmed in basic again, this, this very simple language, um, was incredibly unreliable. Um, people often bought them, had to take them back to the shop. Of course, this is the days before the internet, so you couldn't just order a new one if it didn't work. Um, and so Sinclair, who did this, got a kind of bad reputation for producing poor um, products. But he survived and he, he did other things. Um, but this is, for many people, the sort of introduction to computers. And then at university, um, I found one or two of these, these things, not the hardware. This was a machine using a microprocessor called the Motorola 6800. Um, it's just a box like that uh, called an exerciser. Um, but in order to store data, we use floppy disks. Now, I don't know if you can see the ruler at the bottom. Um, but that's an eight inch floppy disk, 20 centimeters across. Um, I've still got a couple of these. So, so this, this, I took this photograph only a, a day or so ago. And I also found, again, one of the first programs I wrote, the first, one of the first programs for which I have evidence, um, which is over on the right hand side, and is a whole sort of string of what are called assembly language instructions, very low level instructions, which really control the hardware at a very, very basic level. And so, in the first couple of years of university, this was sort of my introduction to, to, to computers. And I think this is what sort of got me hooked. This sort of got interesting. This was something a bit different that I hadn't seen before. And I studied electronic engineering. And I think it's also worth saying at that time, you couldn't really do a computer science degree. You could do maths with computer science. Um, so in order to become interested in computers, if I was interested in the hardware, I really had to do electronic engineering. So that brings me to the second part of this. <clears throat> How do we use computers to design computers? And again, I'll say some things that, that, that I've done and the things that I've been involved in. So one of the first jobs I had over a summer was to write a program to wire up an integrated circuit. So this is a, a diagram showing the sort of various elements uh, that made up an array of logic gates on, on an integrated circuit. This is a circuit that was made at the university. And I think the thing to note about this, and I think the thing that um, struck me when I was doing this work, was that it's very, very sort of irregular. There are no, there are straight lines in it, but things don't line up across, across the chip. We've got these square areas. Um, I, let me just enable my pointer. Um, So we've, we've got these square areas here between these, these columns, but they don't line up with anything that's in these columns. And I recall trying to write software to, to, to wire these things up. This got very difficult because everything had to be sort of zigzagged to get across the chip. The, these areas in the middle were supposed to help you wire things up. It had been designed for people to do this by hand. Now, when we were talking about, I was talking about integrated circuits with the, uh, the Apollo system, 16,000, 17,000 transistors. Yeah, maybe this was sort of the thing you could do by hand, but when we're getting to 4 billion transistors, there's no way. So that was my sort of introduction to computer-aided design, as it's called, or design automation, as it, it later was later called. I then did a PhD, and my PhD work was getting uh, a computer to simulate another computer. Um, that is That helps with the design. It helps with um, uh, modeling things. It helps to understand how a circuit works. And looking back, this was quite a broad piece of work. I had to understand electronic engineering. I had to understand the circuits I was trying to simulate. I had to be able to do programming. Um, I programmed in a language called Pascal, which is sort of obsolete now, but it was a bit like C. And it involved quite a lot of maths. Um, mathematics under, under, underpinned a lot of this because in order to translate things like differential equations that some of you may be familiar with into a form that computers can solve them, you have to use discrete numbers. You can't use um, calculus in the same way that you can on paper. So that's sort of modeling and, and, and routing. The, the step beyond that, and, and I, 
I'm going to sort of jump a few years now. Um, the step beyond that is to do something that we call synthesis. And this is um, basically creating hardware from software. Now, this is a book I wrote 10 or 12 years ago um, because I teach a lot of this material. And this is a, a model over here on the um, left-hand side of a piece of hardware, a counter. It looks like a program. It looks like software. But actually what it's doing is describing hardware. And synthesis programs, synthesis tools, take descriptions like this and transform that into hardware, into gates, into logic. And this is the way the systems are made these days. Not something as simple as, as this, 10 or 12 lines of code, but thousands, millions of lines of code. And they're taken and they're transformed and chips are created from that. But there's a, a problem. How do we know it's correct? And so this is another thing that I've been um, involved in over the years. And looking at this, it's sort of slightly um, perhaps strange that perhaps over the past few years, I've looked more at why things go wrong than why things go right. And that sounds strange, but actually you, you learn a lot by, by focusing on such areas because you really do get a very deep understanding of how things work when you realize, when you start to think about all the ways that things can go wrong. So this question here, how do we know a design is correct? So here's a piece of code. It's, it's intended to move some data down a list. So here's an array. We move um, sample I minus one to sample I, and we go through a loop. This looks okay. At first glance, you think this is going to move everything along by one place. In fact, it's wrong. It does it the wrong way. And, and what actually happens is the whole array is set to the value of the zeroth element. And it's very, very difficult to detect this kind of error. You can sometimes run test programs, you can do other things, you may be able to detect it. There's also questions actually, um, just as an aside, things people get wrong is, I've assumed here we've got an array of 16 elements. Should this be less than 16? Should it be less than or equal to 16? As I said, we're going the wrong way through the array. There's all sorts of things here that people can get wrong. And detecting those mistakes is very, very difficult. And arguably, Verifying a design, checking to see that the design is correct, is more difficult than doing the design in the first place. And so there's a whole class of what are called verification engineers uh, who use essentially mathematics on computers to verify that the design is correct. And I think you can probably argue that people who can do this, verification engineers, actually get more money, get better salaries than those engineers who do the design in the first place because this is so difficult. And obviously you don't want the same person to test the design as the person who wrote it because they'll simply repeat the same errors. But there's also a, a slightly, a, a different problem at, at a different level, which is when we build an integrated circuit or we build a computer, things go wrong. There are manufacturing defects. Now this is not an integrated circuit, this is a solder board. But what you can see here is there are two connections which are nicely separated. These are two connections which have got solder bridging them together. It's a short circuit. And this kind of thing happens when you're manufacturing um, uh, chips, putting them on a, on a printed circuit board, building larger systems. But it also happens within integrated circuits. Integrated circuits are made in clean rooms, but however clean things are, there's still dirt around. Um, you can get all sorts of manufacturing errors. It's just like any other technology, just like making cars or nuts and bolts or anything, mistakes creep in, defects. This is not something the designer has done wrong, it's just a, a natural part of the manufacturing process. But we also get um, problems because chips wear out. This may sound surprising, but uh, a digital integrated circuit probably only has a lifetime of 10 to 20 years. After that time, they start to slow down, they start to, to wear out. Um, this is just a, a natural consequence of, uh, uh, of the technology and people are trying to do things about it. And so we now use computing tools to try and help with testing. We've done this for a long time, probably 40 years of using computers to generate tests to try and find these kind of defects. Um, we, we use computers to help to make our designs more suitable for testing, to make the testing easier. 
Um, we use computers to predict reliability, you know, when will ships wear out, and to help us design chips that are more reliable and more secure. Security is, if you like, one aspect of reliability, or reliability is one aspect of security. They're both concerned with safety. Bad people can try and break chips deliberately. And so we have to protect against that. And increasingly, what we're doing is using machine learning and artificial intelligence to help us do these things. Only two days ago, I was at a, a meeting um, nearby we're bringing together computer scientists, electronic engineers, and so on and so forth to talk about exactly these problems. How can we start to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to help us design and verify computers? So far from um, computer engineering being a kind of solved problem, it's very much an unsolved problem because things, as things get bigger and more complicated, we have to use the technology to check itself. So in the third part of this, I want to go on and say something about studying at Southampton and about electronics computer science here. Um, Southampton is a city on the south coast of England, it's about an hour away from London. Um, it's quite an old city, the, the, this picture here is of the, the old city gate, um, which dates from around about 14th century, um, so five, six, seven hundred years old, still standing. There are still city walls. Um, uh, this Southampton is mentioned, I think, in, in Henry V, um, uh, part one. Oh, no, sorry, it's Henry V by Shakespeare. There was a so called Southampton plot, and a couple of characters were executed, you know, allegedly right by, by the bar gate here. Um, it's a port. There are, you know, there are boats there that people keep for leisure use, but there's also big liners come in. The campus itself. Um, I'm actually sort of on the opposite side of this building, somewhere up here, um, looking the other way. Uh, this is the, the clean rooms uh, at Southampton where we build integrated circuits, we build uh, optical fibres and things like that. This is part of the campus in summer. It's not quite as green as that at the moment, we're, we're coming into winter. Um, this is the library and there's a, a bus interchange and, and so on and so forth. As was said earlier, we've got this campus in Malaysia. Um, we it's this, this is a new building um, in the Eco Botanic. I haven't visited this campus. I visited the old campus. Um, this is much bigger, better. Um, we're going to grow, have more students here. We've been offering electronics and electrical engineering um, in Malaysia since 2013. Uh, students would spend, would spend two years in Malaysia, two years in Southampton. Uh, we've now been offering computer science in Malaysia since 2022, I think. So into the second year, that's growing. Um, we're going to offer more places. There's also things like business studies and so on coming on in this campus. I'm not sure. With, I think this is a drawing rather than a photograph. As I say, I haven't actually visited this campus yet. Um, so what do we offer? In electronics computer science, we have a whole bunch of degrees. Um, computer science, which covers programming, artificial intelligence. There's two flavors of our degrees. We have three-year degrees, which are bachelors of science or bachelors of engineering, and we have four-year Masters of Engineering programs. So we've got computer science, software engineering. Software engineering is, is computer science, but um, much more focused on the engineering side of things, how, how big systems work, how we take into account the consequences of the engineering and so on and so forth. We have electronic engineering, which is very simply low voltage, low power, and electrical engineering, which is high voltage, high power. Um, so machines, but also electricity generation. And we've got this um, combination, electrical and electronic engineering, which is a, a bit of both and allowing students to, to move across. Um, and we've also got a, a degree in mechatronics, which mixes mechanical and electrical engineering. So this would cover things like um, um, electrical motors and, and powertrains in cars. And so this is my last slide. We, we've had lots and lots of applicants. We're still growing, we expect very high grades. Numbers of students this year has increased quite dramatically. Um, and in order to um, continue this growth, we're actually starting two new programs in 2024. Computer engineering, which is sort of what I've been talking about, and artificial intelligence, which comes, you know, as I've said, cuts into all of this, um, the things I've been discussing. Um, these are not the old degrees, but with new modules. These are entirely new degrees. 
Um, we're going to create new modules within these degrees to do these degrees because we don't want to have big classes of 400 students, for example, you know, computer science students and these new new degree programs put together. They're going to be separate modules that can keep them apart so the students get a much uh, better educational experience. And in uh, some ways, this is the future. This is bringing together the, the design of systems, bringing together computer science and electronic engineering and bringing together the, the new technologies of artificial intelligence and so on. I may have exceeded my time, so I'm going to stop there and open up to any questions. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much, Mark. That's fantastic. And just as Mark was saying, that just about how competitive computer science is becoming at Southampton, that, that's very much a kind of global trend in the UK trend. Yeah. You will see that these really are now, if you look at the grades being asked for, and just the sheer numbers of applicants to places, Southampton and places like Manchester, Cambridge, Imperial, and the top places that are often computer science, they really are now the places that are, you know, are most difficult to get into. Yeah. So while we do need to do a lot of focus and, you know, and make sure that our applications are very strong when it comes to this. And, and, and I, I will emphasize the point, I've, I've mentioned mathematics several times through this talk, and I'll, I'll make that point again, that one of the things that all universities will be looking for are good grades in mathematics. Um, you don't always need mathematics to do computer science. You certainly need it for electronic engineering. You certainly need um, mathematics for artificial intelligence. But even if you don't go into any of those areas, mathematics is seen as a strong indicator of the ability to think in a logical um, manner, which is a skill you need in order to do any kind of programming. I think I think that's actually quite good. I, obviously, I, as you know, <laughs> watch a lot of these presentations and things like this. Uh, I think just and again, just a reminder, anyone coming on, if you want to ask a question, just use the chat function um, at the bottom here. Mark went into a bit of mathematical detail, and it is quite nice, actually, to get that level of genuine academic depth when we have these presentations. So I think Mark would be more than happy if you wanted to ask him actual kind of more core mathematical questions as well. You can obviously ask him anything about careers, about the course, about anything you like. But if it was actually kind of uh, about the, the applied nature of maths within computer science and engineering, I'm sure he'd like to, to answer those questions as well. So you've really um, got um, a, a, a big scope here. I'm going to stop sharing the screen for the moment so that yeah. perhaps you can, I can sort of see if anybody, all right, I can, I can now see. Yeah. So if you want to turn your camera on when you're asking a question, if that's easier as well. Yeah, you have that option too, Mark. They, they tend not to take no, that know, option, I know, I know. but absolutely. You can switch your camera on, switch your microphone on, ask a question, raise your hand, do it that way too. Most people seem more happy with the chat function. Mark, I'd just like to ask one of the things that you kind of raised really. Um, you made a really, uh, you, you mentioned the verification engineers. And I, th I think that's something, again, that, you know, I've had probably two conversations with students today about computer science and where it leads in terms of careers, obviously looking at broader areas, things like finance. But in yeah. terms of some of these actual, perhaps more specific areas, that's a new one on me, actually. And that's, that's just, I'll probably use that as an example in the future. Are, are there other examples like that you think that maybe the students wouldn't have heard of in terms of perhaps more IT based um, areas of employment? Well, I mean, IT is in everything. So, I mean, you know, in a sense, um, yes, you mentioned financial, you know, fintech is, is clearly a, an important area. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, verification engineering, I'm talking really, it, it, it's very much in the electronics in industry. Um, but I think, I think that, I think there's sort of scope for, um, a lot of things that have a kind of um, well, let me turn this around. If you've got a technical background, whether it's computer science, computer engineering, electronic engineering, whatever, I think it is seen as a, a rigorous um, degree. It's a tough degree to study. You know, our students, uh, I, I say to, I've got duties, first year students, so I see in a, a group. Um, and I say, you know, how, how, how's it going? And they will say, we're working really, really hard. You know, um, this is not the sort of degree you can do and, and, and spend six hours working and then go and get a part time job. It's, it's a full time job to, to study on this. And it covers a lot of material. And I think the, 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 the other side of that is that if you if you've done such a degree, um, employers will um, recognize those skills, that, that ability to think in a, a logical way, that ability to organize yourself. 
and if it's in a sense that's transferable to almost anything um but I, I i mean you know going back to your point name an industry that doesn't involve computers or it these days i can't think of one no, absolutely well actually i was asked earlier today it's, that's another interesting way of looking at it and i think the students on this uh, rex i think you're there and we were looking at sort of saying well actually if you look at other degrees that were high value in the past yeah, they're still valuable in, in, a, in perhaps a broader sense uh, something like law but actually yeah. law as an industry has diminished somewhat in various areas so the same question he was sort of applying to computer science and it so how would you answer that i mean are there bits of it where we've seen old you've covered quite the history of it so i guess there are jobs and things that would become defunct if we're looking at um, the it and computer science as a as an industry well i, I mean <laughs> this is an interesting question because i think you know in the past we promised that a lot of the low level jobs would be abolished by by robotics by whatever i mean certainly you know manufacturing jobs factory jobs you know that the, the robots have taken over we don't have people um, on production lines anymore whether the sort of white collar jobs are going to get replaced i don't know i mean there is an argument for, for things like law for that was a good example the law is, is very logical uh, relies on background knowledge why why cannot law you know a lot of law law stuff basic law stuff be done by artificial intelligence you know searching for um uh, case studies or searching through contracts and so on you know um can we talk? i mean it, it also reveals i think sometimes that laws can be very very inconsistent um um but at the moment i i don't see jobs disappearing because of this i don't think we're quite at that stage yet i i'm i'm People talk a lot about artificial intelligence. I'm a skeptic. I, I think a lot of what we have at the moment is simply pattern matching. It's simply finding patterns and things. And even the, the you know, Siri or Alexa or whatever, it's recognizing what you're saying against an existing pattern. That's all it's doing. There's no real intelligence there. And, and unless we make some big breakthrough, I don't see the, the, the white collar jobs, the, the, the office jobs that require real intelligence um, as disappearing. What I think is going to happen is we're going to get assistance. We're going to get automatic assistance to what we're doing. Um, so, you know, if you, even if you want to study law or, or accountancy or whatever, I think there'll still be the demand. I just don't see that going yet. Yeah. Okay, that's great, and it gives give people a sense of it. But again, obviously, you can see there's obviously a high demand for this. Hence, hence the, the difficulty. Yeah, there, but but I mean, e equally, uh, I mean, I think if you're studying law now. You have to be familiar with with a lot of these these things, and, and of course, there's a whole area of law now which covers um, which covers um, information technology and, and so on and so forth. And, and you know, the law surrounding self driving cars is going to be a very very interesting thing to watch in the future. Yes. Who's um, responsible? Indeed, um, just um, again, very quiet students today. The, your, you computer science ones are normally a bit more active on these. Oh, games, somebody's got the camera on. Is that is that for a question? Stephen? I think he's just come into the room is why. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, but that's fine. No problem at all. You can keep getting my questions, but I know your questions would be. I, I'm, I'm going to have to go in about 10 minutes. So, no so there, is, there is limited time here. There's limited time. No problem at all. Okay. One of the other, I think, things that I think people would probably like to know is, is other areas they could prepare in now? I think one of the common questions that did tend to come up was about things like coding as a skill. And again, as you pointed out earlier, you know, I know down the road for you at Sussex, they don't ask for high level maths for their computer science course, and you guys do, and other places will ask for further math. So all these courses are bringing in students with different levels of mathematical ability. And there's also other technical skills like coding. How important are these things coming in to, to the course? Well, I, we get students, I think we get students who've done lots and lots of coding, whether it's hobbies or whether it's schoolwork, and students who've done none. Um, I think we don't, we, we try and bring everybody up to the same kind of standards by the end of the first year, but we recognise there are different, different skills. We don't ask for a computer science qualification at A level or, or the equivalent. Um, um, I think that's partly, I mean, there's no harm in having one, but it's not a, it's not a necessity. Um, I think there's, I think we recognize, uh, and we've done, taken some steps to, 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 to rectify this, is that sometimes teaching 
computer science in schools can be difficult. Um, just as there's a shortage of, of people to do this in industries, there's a shortage of people to, to teach computer science in schools. So we have to make, we can't make assumptions, too many assumptions about that background. It will certainly help if you can program, if you have got experience, whether it's using something like a Raspberry Pi or whether it's using, um, you know, just make, building apps for, for a phone or anything like that, any kind of programming skill will help because you learn certain things, you learn how to think in a particular way. And that's important. Um, I remember when I was, well, I, I think it's going right back to my PhD, I was trying to do something in programming and I just didn't get it and suddenly it went click and I got it. I now understood what the problem was. Um, and so I do sympathize with people who, who students and, and others who sort of look at things that I don't, I don't get this. I don't understand what's happening. I don't understand what I have to do now. And I just, my response is keep trying, keep trying. It will click eventually. Um, and there, and actually there are things, even something like Excel, Excel spreadsheets and people writing macros, that is a form of programming. And people who say they can't program can very often code up quite um, sophisticated things within Excel without realizing what they're doing. Um, but I, so, so I, it's developing that ability to think in a logical manner, to break things down into steps, to get the steps in the right order. Um, that's really, really important. And once you've, you've got that skill and once you think in that way, the whole approach to, to coding anything becomes much, much easier. Fantastic. And I think I've got one final question for you before, before we bring, bring it to an end. Uh, and that is it's, it's kind of related really and that's on work experience and obviously yeah. Southampton like many places will offer the option to do a work experience year um, how, how do you feel about that I, I guess I guess the question would oh. be is there a key difference between the students that do and don't do it as, as, as in terms of how, how do, they we, approach things? yeah I'll be, care I'll be careful what we say here um we we, we offer a, a degree program um students can take a year out and we, we put a badge on it with industrial studies if they completed that. Not many students do that, to be honest. Um, the reason we introduced it was because it's a, a nice little way around a visa. It gives students an ability to, to get that experience if it's part of the degree program. But many of our students, most of our students, I think, um, don't take a year out. They do three or four years, but they do get internships over the long vacation in the summer, 10 or 12 weeks. Um, now we we have lots of companies coming to us um, saying, "Have you got students?" Um, it's very interesting. I think the the world is going through a, a very interesting phase at the moment, kind of post COVID. Um, a lot of people took early retirement. Um, a lot of people companies restructured. There's now a desperate shortage of engineers, computer scientists, and people are very keen to recruit. One of the consequences of that is that there are these summer placements available and they pay. Um, I don't think any good student should ever do a free in, an internship for free. You're giving away your time for nothing and certainly never pay a company to do an internship. I have seen those things before. Um, you should be able to get, you know, uh, um, a, a decent salary, whether it's in Malaysia, whether it's in the UK, whatever. Those opportunities are there. And I think companies are getting started to get quite desperate because as the as things pick up post COVID, um, there really aren't enough people to go around. Um, and so, yeah, go for it. I think it's also um, I don't know if you're aware, um, but the UK has changed the visa requirements fairly recently. There used to be something 10 years ago called the post study work visa, which allows students with technical degrees to do two years employment without uh, automatic visa that was abolished now something similar has been brought back particularly within stem subjects um yeah. and so if you do get a degree in the uk there is i think i can't promise but there is a, a strong chance that you will be able to pick up employment here um and obviously if you're two here for two years and you're good the company will then um make efforts to keep you um I was going to say something else. Oh, yes. Um, I, the other thing I would say is the university cannot promise. We can't control what companies do. Companies um, come and go. Um, they change things. But we have really good links. We have talked to people, uh, companies coming in. Um, Apple came in a few weeks ago to talk about, well, computer engineering. Um, you know, any, any big companies you can think of, you know, come, come and try and get students. We, we have a lot of competition. Um, and we also run projects in, in the fourth year, which are sponsored by companies. 
Um, and so students get an opportunity there to interact with a company over a, over a semester, over 10 or 12 weeks, um, trying to solve a problem for a company. Um, and I think both the companies and the um, students get a lot out of that. Absolutely fantastic. Listen, we're going to bring it to an end there. Uh, it's been really, I think, really great presentation, really great talk, a lot of depth to it. So I think students are going to be able to take away a lot of, a lot of good information from that. That's really good. Certainly in terms of looking at their future careers, perspective, certain what areas and going to, I think you've isolated that really well. Um, what we're going to say now is, Mark, if you're able just to stay on for one more minute, just so that we can, we can just say goodbye, sort some stuff out. Everyone else, thank you very much for coming this evening. Have a nice day off tomorrow. And so if you would like to log off the call now, please do.